How was everybody's 4th of July? Y'all see some boom boom, some fireworks? Um, I'm going to pray one more time, all right? Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for uh, your sovereignty. I thank you for um, your son Jesus coming down to earth so that we could have eternal life. God, would you just speak tonight? And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just fall on this place. God, and that you have the freedom to move and do whatever you want to do tonight. We invite your presence here. God, do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, for you don't know me, uh, I'm Daddy Boathouse. <laughs> oh, yep. Or the old man in the group or whatever you want to call. Um, so July 4th was an interesting time. We uh, had all the babies home, you know, so Josiah and Johanna, Josh, and that was fun. Um, one of the things that we like to do is watch movies as a family, all right? And I don't know, y'all can judge me if you want, I don't really care. So uh, Tangled, who's a Tangled fan? All right, I'm going to say it. It's top three, top three. I'll say it. And ain't no judgment. I don't care. I'm a big redneck. I love to hunt, fish, all that. But I like me some tangle, too. So um, tonight, we're going to talk about, yeah, don't be shaking your head. I see all y'all back there shaking your head. I'm telling you, man, tangle's a good show. Um, so we're going to talk about the Hall of Faith. And we're going to be introducing a brand new uh, study for Boathouse. And one of the things we talked about about six months ago was trying to determine what do, we want to, what do we want to talk about, right? And so we began to pray and ask God, what do you want us to talk about, Lord? And one of the things that kept pump, popping up, the more people I visit with, we all got jacked up families, uh, mine included. And if yours is not, you're lying. So I'll go ahead and say that. Um, so in, that, in the hall of faith, in Hebrews chapter 11, you can go ahead and get your word out and kind of be heading in that direction. That's where we're going to start with. And then we're going to flip back to Genesis. But um, so... The writers of Tangled did something interesting. And I didn't notice this until we were all sitting together watching this over the July 4th break. We were sitting there, and I don't know if y'all remember the beginning of Tangled. Do y'all remember that, how that thing opens up? Flynn Rider. I just brought a little picture because I know you guys need to see Flynn Rider. And this thing is not working. Here it is. Let's go, Wayne. There it is. Let's go. <laughs> They always get his nose wrong. So I have a Flynn Rider in my family. It's Josiah. I'll go ahead and say it. So, yeah, y'all, all you OG squad, y'all laugh about that. So Josiah has got the, the Flynn Rider smolder down to an art. And it's pretty cool, right? I mean, we're in the movie, watching the movie, and I'm like, all right, Josiah, hit it. And so he does it, <laughs> and he looks just like Flynn Rider doing the smolder, which is kind of funny. So um, anyway, so Flynn Rider opens the movie, and I didn't notice this before, and I don't know how I missed this piece. The first words Flynn Rider says is, I, this story is about my death. I'm like, wow, I didn't remember that actually being announced at the very beginning of the story. So it opens with Flynn Rider saying, yeah, I'm fixing to die. But that's not what the story's really about. So there's a word for that called reverse chronology where you start with the end in mind and then you go back. So this is basically what we're fixing to do tonight. We're gonna to talk about a guy named Joseph. So, but in the middle of that, I was thinking about what, is, what, what was cool about Joseph besides how he got to where he was. Well, in Hebrews chapter 11, he actually announce, announces why he's in the hall of faith. So I want you to look tonight, obedience by faith from tangled moments in Joseph's life. We all got tangled moments. And I want you to think about your life and think about your past through, different, through a little different lens. What if our lives are measured not in time, but what if it's measured in moments? So, I want to throw out another thing to you guys. You have no idea what God can do through one moment of obedience. Let me give you an example. 
So whenever I was growing up, I grew up in the middle of 300 acres over in northeast Louisiana, a little town called Oak Grove. Let's go, Louisiana people. So I'm over there, and I'm in about the fifth or sixth grade, and I remember my grandmother telling me this. She said, Lane, one day God is going to use your brokenness, and he's going to, use, he's going to fill you with wisdom, and God is going to use that. So now I'm 52 years old, and I still revert back to what my grandmother told me, and I can show you the spot where she showed me as we were walking down the road, which was a quarter-mile driveway up to my mom and daddy's house. And I think about that, and I go, if somebody need to take their medicine. So what, from that one instant that my grandmother spoke that into me, I remember that now, and I look back on my life, and I'm looking to see how God has fulfilled that promise through my grandmother, what she said. So let me give you some examples. I was a senior in college. I walked down front as an eight-year-old kid and went down to the front of the church, and I can't tell you exactly if that's exactly where I committed my life to Christ but when I was a senior in college, I remember I went to a Mission 95 conference, which was, that'll tell you how old I am. So Mission 95 is kind of like a passion conference. Some of you guys have been to that, right? So, and the speaker's talking, and he's talking about brokenness, and I go, dude, he's talking about me. Like the guy knew my past, and he knew my story. And all of a sudden, next thing I know, I'm down front going, Lord, I, whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, I'm in. That was one act of obedience. And from that, God brought me to Tyler, Texas to teach two things. One thing I'm passionate about is Jesus. Second thing I'm passionate about is water skiing, surfing, being on the lake, all right? And he brought me to this little place called Pine Cove. And the next thing I know, I'm the sales manager. Next thing I know, I'm the sales director. Next thing I know, I'm meeting mama. And next thing I know, we got three kids. Next thing I know, one of them's being mentored by Biebs. Next thing I know, they're inviting me to this thing called Tubing Tuesdays. And the next thing I know, I'm involved with this thing getting it started called Boathouse. Next thing I know, I'm sitting here in front of you talking right now. You see the moments? You tracking with me? I'm looking and I'm seeing the hand of God and all of a sudden I go, huh, what if my life's not measured in time, but what if it's measured in moments? So why is Hebrew 11 called the Hall of Faith, all right? So flip open to Hebrews chapter 11, and that answer is actually found in Hebrews 11, verse 1. And read it here, check it out. It says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. That sounds like riddle me this, young Skywalker. I mean, that sounds like a riddle, right? I don't even know what that means. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. What do you hope for? Well, that answer is actually found in Scripture as well. 1 Timothy 1.1 1, 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus, our hope. Man, your only hope is in one thing. You ain't got hope in your job. You ain't got hope in your school. You ain't got hope in your athletic ability. You don't have hope in your girlfriend, your boyfriend. You don't have hope in squat. Because all those things can be taken away in about less than 0.2 seconds. There's only one thing that can't be taken away from you, and that's Jesus Christ. So check this out. In Titus 2, verse 13, it says, Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So here's what the writer did. He stacked Hebrews 11 full of these characters from the Bible, true life people that are, had seriously jacked up past. One of those, and we're going to talk about tonight, is my favorite one, which happens to be Joseph. So... Why is Joseph in the hall of faith, and who is this cat, all right? So here it is, Hebrews eleven twenty two. I'm going to read the verse, and then we're going to jump back from that. Just like Flynn Ryder said in the beginning, he died, check this out. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, he was thinking to die, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones, all right? This dude lived till he was 110 years old. This is the very end of his life. And he's telling them, you're going to take my body and you're going to move it from Egypt over to the promised land. But check this out. It didn't happen for another 179 years. 
That's why he's listed in the hall of faith. He looked around in all of Egypt and he was filled with people, Israelites, that are in the body of Egypt. And I'm going to tell you all how he got there in just a few minutes. We're going to talk about it. And all of a sudden, he's being taken, his bones, from Egypt over to the promised land. Joseph's family is jacked up just like yours and mine. Genesis 25 through 20, 27 through 28. Check this out. There were twins that were born. And I can identify with this. I got twins. Josiah and Johanna are twins, right? And they were called, uh, of Isaac and Rebecca, they were called Jacob and Esau. The boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter. I think we'd be friends. A man of the open country while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. He was a mama's boy at the tents. All right, he didn't like to leave mama. Check this out. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau. But Rebecca loved Jacob. Who in here is the favorite child? Oh, yeah, Ryan, I know you're the favorite one. Yeah, uh-huh. If you didn't raise your hand, more than likely you're probably the favorite child. Uh, you know, what's sad is here, mom had her favorite, dad had his favorite. What is that about, dude? You know, that's, that's setting it up for a messed up situation. So you say, Lane, why are you showing me this? Well, here's why I'm showing you this. This is the lineage from Father Abraham. You know, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. You're one of them. So y'all didn't sing that. Come on, dude. Leave me hanging like that. All right. Okay, so this is Father Abraham all the way down to Jesus. Well, here's why I'm showing you this. So Father Abraham, by Sarah, had Isaac, all right? But he also had a handmaiden named Hagar. And because Sarah wasn't having babies as fast as they thought, well, have my handmaiden Hagar and have a child by her. So now we've got Ishmael and Isaac. Guys, y'all want to know what's going on over in the uh, Far East right now? It's because of these two guys right here. Because of this relationship right here. The Jewish people versus like the Palestinians and all of that. You hear about that on the news? All of that? That all stems back to this right here. This is why you want to pay attention to this. Because of what is happening over there right now came from this story right here. Okay, so keep looking down that family tree and look what you see. So they had Isaac and Rebekah had Jacob and Esau. These are the twins. They said when Esau came out of Rebekah, Jacob was grabbing onto his heel. He was called the grabber. Okay, well, because Isaac loved Esau and Rebekah loved Jacob, Isaac, Esau was the firstborn. So he was supposed to get the birthright. But Re Rebecca, trick, with Jacob's help, tricked Isaac by putting goat's hair on his arm, fixing a meal for Daddy Isaac because his eyes were really bad, and Isaac blessed the younger one instead of the older one. It was all done by deceit. And we're going to see that as we go on. So check this out. Jacob, just to show you how the deceit keeps going, Jacob goes and works for his uncle Laban, all right? And he looks out in the field, and there is this hot lady, Miss Rachel. She's smoking. She is hot, okay? And he says, I want to marry her. Well, Laban is a cunning guy, and he's like, okay, you can marry her, but you got to work seven years in order to get her. All right, so they didn't have real good lighting back then, right? So, I mean, let's just say it. They didn't have all these fancy lights back in there. So he worked his seven years, and, man, he was so excited to go and marry Rachel. Well, because the lighting wasn't real great, and it come nighttime, Uncle Laban slipped weak-eyed Leah into his tent instead of Rachel. So when that brother woke up in the morning when the sun come up, he's done consummated a marriage with weak-eyed Leah instead of Rachel. Wurk. Wurk, wurk. I mean, can you imagine how ticked off you would be? Like, uh, who is this? What is she doing in my tent? And what did we do last night? What happened? You're tracking with me? This is bad, right? But Laban says, hey, man, you got to take the first one first because she's the older sister. If you want Rachel, you got to work seven more years. Fourteen years that brother slaved for Rachel. I mean, you see how messed up this is? This is messed up. So that's what he did. 
And he said, because Rachel was so beautiful, just a, a year seemed like a day. Dude, that's 14 years of your life gone. You crazy, man. Uh-uh, no. I'm doing that, weren't? Not at all. Okay, but also just check out how, how jacked this up is. You see Reuben there? So Reuben was the firstborn of Leah. Well, Reuben actually went and slept with Bilhah, his daddy's other wife. Now, I'm guessing that in this, in this room, we have a lot of jacked up situations. I don't know that we've got one this messed up. I'm just going to be honest with you. I've heard a lot of things through Boathouse, but this is pretty messed up. Everybody agree with that? Right. Okay. So that's, that's what we're working with. All right. So what dream, here's, here's something I want you to think about. And uh, Clay already kind of let it out of the bag. What has God placed in your heart, a longing that he's placed in your heart? or a dream, or an idea. You say, well, Lane, like what? I, I, I don't know. I don't know what that is. I can tell you that when my grandmother spoke over me at that time, I've been looking, God, what do you want to do through me? And that's translated into what do I do when I go to the gym? What do I do when I go to work? What do I do when I go to boathouse? What do I do wherever my feet are? Wherever you are, that's where your ministry is, okay? So, but it all starts with one moment of obedience. All right, check this out. Let's read a minute. Y'all stay with me. Here we go. Joseph's dreams. This is now we're going to flip back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 37, 1 through 11, all right? Joseph was a dreamer, all right? Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed. This is chapter 37, verse 1 through 11. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. He's a tattletale. I imagine he's a little bit of a toot, my guess is. So he's a little cocky. Joseph, now in verse 3, now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other brothers. I wonder where he learned that. Anybody remember that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't fall far from the tree, does it? Because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and couldn't speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Just like entangled, he had a dream. I love it. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were high, uh, binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose up and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around, my, around mine and bowed down to it. What you think that did for them? Man, I would be severely ticked off. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, right. I ain't bowing down to you. You're on crack. No, not happening. <laughs> nope, not doing that. And his brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more. Then he had another dream, and they told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. Dude, shut up. Stop telling your dreams. You can have them, just don't tell nobody. You know what I'm saying? No, he had to tell them. Listen, he said, I had another dream. The time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me this time, when he told it to his fathers as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, whoa, what's this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the good ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept that matter in mind. So why is God's timing always perfect? I can tell you why. Because he's a holy God. And why did Joseph have them dreams? Why did he put a dream in you? Why did he allow you to come to UT Tyler, TJC, Arkansas, Oh, you, wherever you are, your job. Why, why, why are you where you are? Because his timing's perfect. Here's my life verse. It's Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. If you hear me talk at all, you're probably going to hear that verse. Because I know that because I've seen it. I know for a fact that I shouldn't even be here. 
When I was uh, about six years old, I was on a tractor with my dad, and back then the tractors had fenders on them, all right? And I used to ride everywhere with my dad, and we had what was called these big flip-over braking plows, and they would go and they would knife down in the ground and cut into the ground about three feet deep down and flip it over. So we were, I was riding up on the fender of this tractor, and that plow hung into a, a big uh, root, and it stopped that tractor dead on a hammer and was just sitting there spinning. I fell off the tractor and fell under the cleat of that tractor. And when my dad stopped that, that, that tractor, that cleat was that close to my eyeball. I shouldn't be here. And I can name about 10 more other times that I shouldn't be here. By God's grace, he has allowed me to be here tonight to tell y'all this message. He's not done with you. And the reason I know that is because you're here tonight. Check this out. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing. All right, so they see Joseph coming. All right, here's picture this in the movie of your mind. They see Joseph coming, and they're like, all right, what are we going to do with this dude? I'm tired of hearing about his dreams. I'm tired of hearing about him. What are we going to do to him? Let's kill him. Can you imagine that your family has gotten so jacked up that they're talking about killing each other? Well, that's where they're at. So they took him and threw him into a cistern, and the cistern was empty, and there was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. The camels were loaded with spices, bombs, myrrh, blah, blah, blah. And they said, to, the Judah said to his brothers, hey, man, what will we gain if we kill our brother? And covering up his blood. Let's sell him to these Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother. Well, thank you for some sense. And his brothers all agreed. When the Midianite merchants came by, they sold Joseph for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. All right, stop there for a second. Why were the Ishmaelites, the Midianites, just happened to be traveling by at this exact time? These cats were out just getting their camels ready two months ago to travel through this area at just the right time that the brothers were plotting this. Does anybody but me see the God's hand all over this? Joseph had a dream. And his dream that he was going to be leading all the people. He didn't know how he was going to get there. He had no idea. But next thing he knows, he's thrown into a pit by his brothers. Now, I would be questioning God's dreams at this point. Right? And you say, well, Lane, why am I here at UT Tyler TJC? I don't know. I don't know, but I can tell you this. He's got a plan. Your Midianite traders may be coming by at just the right time, and it may be tonight. And these guys were not saved. They weren't Christians. God's using things in your life that you go, I don't see how that could possibly happen. I'm here to tell you tonight, God will use lost people in your life to bring you closer to him to fulfill the purpose that he's put in your life. That's what's happening. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar. <laughs> it just keeps getting worse. Now the dude's done got sold again. One of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Now I'm going to tell you something. I read a, a commentary on that Potiphar dude, right? He's the captain of the guard. I didn't know this. That means that sucker's been castrated. What? Did you just say that at Boathouse? Yeah, I did. So he's a eunuch in the captain's guards inside the palace. Does anybody see where Joseph's headed? And he's not going just straightway, hey, let's just take you into the palace and let you run the ship. He's going to Potiphar's house to be a slave. Check it out. Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. Y'all check out this next verse. I want y'all to write this and scribe this over you. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of the Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. 
The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he didn't concern himself with anything except the food he ate. He said, man, Joseph got it. I love me some Joseph. I'm telling you tonight, young people, be a Joseph. Wherever you are. When I was in college, I was a janitor at a church. I hated cleaning toilets. I got here to Pine Cove, and you know what the first thing they said for me to go do was? Scrub the toilets. I was a professional toilet scrubber. I would clean them things, sparkle them, make them shine. Because here's the thing. I knew God didn't call me to scrub toilets, but I knew he had me there in order for me to learn a few lessons about humility and learn some things that I needed to learn and so that God could actually use me. You say, I don't know why he's got me in this job he's got me in. I don't know why he's got me in this degree. I don't know why. I don't know either. But I know a God that is sovereign. And I know a God that loves you. And a God that's got a plan for you. Check this out. Now, Joseph was well built and handsome. Mm -hmm. He's a Flynn rider. He's a stud. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph. Uh Uh-oh. He got some choices to make. And she said, come to bed with me. Weren't. But he refused. (laughs) With me in charge, he told her, my master doesn't concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns is entrusted to my care. No one is greater in that house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against Potiphar? Mm -mm, That's not what he said. He said, Wicked thing and sin against God. And though she spoke to Joseph day after day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Dude, you're going to be in some positions and you got some choices to make. And you may be in one right now because I don't know what you did before you got here. I can tell you right now from your moment of obedience, man, you can fall in one moment of not being obedient. All of this could have taken a severe left turn if he would have decided to go to bed with her. The reason I know that is because Reuben went to bed with his, his dad's wife. There is not one famous person that came out of Reuben's tribe. Interesting, huh? But Reuben was the firstborn. It should have been coming out of him. But he chose sin. The good thing about being a follower of Christ is, though, no matter what you've done, and you're going to hear me say this at Boathouse, I could give two flips about what you've done. You don't know what all I've done. I don't know what you've done. But I know a God who can cover all of it. What did Joseph do? Here's what Joseph did. Man, he Colossians 3 and Titus 2 it. You say, Lane, what does that mean? Man, that sucker... He set his mind on things above. He had his mind on that, on, that, on that goal. He already done had them two dreams. God gave him two dreams. It's interesting, and we're going to read about some more of these dreams here in a few minutes. He gave him two dreams. In both dreams, he knew what he was called to do. I can tell you right now, there's enough people in this room right now, you know what you're supposed to do. Some of you, hadn't, you've been running from God. You've been running from getting baptized. You've been running from accepting Christ. You've been running from drop-kicking that boyfriend. You've been running from drop-kicking that girlfriend. Here's my question. Are you as radical about your obedience as you were about your sin? Man, sit on that for a minute. Are you as radical with your obedience and your repentance as you are with your sin? Well, it's a good step. You be a, you're here tonight. <laughs> so I, I went to listing it off. I'm like, I'm going to think, Lord, what do you want to say? He said, get him a flip phone. All right, I'm writing it down. So I put down, get a flip phone. You say, Lane, you are 1971 born. I don't care if that's what it means. If it means you stop looking at porn on that dead gun phone, get you a flip phone. And I, I'm dead serious. Man, if y'all want a wife like mama, Get you a flip phone. It's worth it. You want to raise godly babies? 
get a flip phone. Yeah, I said it. Uh oh. Now he done gone to meddling and probing. Get off social media. Maybe that's what you need to do. Or maybe you need to take a break from it. Yeah, I said it. Get in the parking lot and end it. Dude, if she's not the best for you and he's not the best for you, end it. Maybe somebody just needs to say it. And maybe that's why God has me here tonight. I have, <laughs> it's funny, last time I talked, it's been about a year almost, I think. I, was, and I said the same thing. I, it's my annual time to say it speech. End it. Get in that parking lot and end it. If you don't need to, go to the back of the room. I don't care where you end it. End it. <laughs> if you need me to come and intervene, I'll be glad to. <laughs> okay. Because here's the deal, guys. Full obedience, it ain't for wimps. It takes a real man to do that. It takes a real woman to do that. You want to be a Proverbs 31 woman? Bell being obedient. Let your moment be tonight. Here's the deal, guys. I, and I'm speaking from a, an area of brokenness, okay? When I first started my job, one of the things I had to do was travel a lot. And I'd get in the hotel rooms, and man, there's a TV there that's got crap on it. And I was so convicted about what I was watching when I wasn't with mama and when I wasn't at home. So I asked my accountability guys, and I said, man, I need help. I don't, I don't want to look at that junk anymore. And so they asked me this question, so I'm going to ask it to you. Where's your towel? You say, what do you mean by that, Lane? Here's what I mean by that. Some of you guys are going to have jobs where you travel. You're going to be away from the house. You're going to be away from your family. And you're going to have opportunities to sin. Get your towel out of that room in there and go and cover that TV. You know what I do when I get to a hotel room now? I take a picture of that, ho of that, of that TV covered in a towel and I send it to my accountability guys. Showing them that this is not going to bring down my family. Yeah, I'm 52 and as long as you're a, a male, you're going to struggle with that. So let me just go ahead and say that tonight. Maybe it's a female. Maybe you struggle with it as well. Get your towel out, hang it over your TV. It ain't worth it. It's not worth it. You want a godly family? You do radical things, okay? All right. Mama says me to move on, so I'm moving on. All right, Genesis 39. Check this out. When his master heard the story, uh, his wife told him, saying, this is Potiphar talking, this is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison... The Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Y'all remember that? Remember what Potiphar's house, what happened? Same story, different place. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care. Anybody remember hearing this? Yeah, same song, different verse, right? So, because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Man, Tonight, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and strike that, that stake in the ground so that the Lord can be with you wherever you go, so that you will be successful wherever you go. It may, and this is not a prosperity thing. Your success may not be materially. It may not be the way you think. Joseph had a dream that he's headed to the palace. He ain't got no idea how he's going to get there. Right now, he's a slave. Focus on the mission, man, not your circumstances. Here's, here's one of the things that I noticed about this. Did y'all notice that nowhere in Scripture that we've talked about right now, it doesn't say that he griped and complained and moaned and belly ached about being where he was. He never complained. It's not written in Scripture. I'm talking to me because I complain a lot. And I'm like, God, why did you allow that to happen? Here you go, last night, check this out, y'all. No, there's no lie. I am, I'm here, and I'm just come up here to kind of get alone, to focus on the talk, right? I am, <laughs> I'm, first off, I'm driving in right up here, and I'll be dog, y'all, if I'm lying, I'm dying. 
a big pine tree goes poof right across the road. So a pine tree fell across the driveway coming into here so I couldn't come in here. So I had to go back up, call the manager of the club to come in, to get in here, came in through the back way. I sat down right here. I'm sitting here and I look, <laughs> y'all, I look up and right over here behind, and it was pouring sheets last night, right? And water starts <laughs> pouring across the floor. And I look and here comes water through the door. And I'm like, holy smokes, this is going to be a good talk tomorrow night. Because <laughs> there's a lot of junk going down. And about the time last night that electricity goes out, we didn't even know if he's going to have power today. I'm telling you, man, <laughs> Satan's got a plan too. Obedience does not mean you're going to have an easy life. Let me tell you what's going to happen. The instant that you accept Christ, you now have a big old target on your back, and your life's fixing to go to probably hell in a handbasket. But that's okay. Because look where Joseph's been. He's been in a cistern, a big old hole in the ground. He's been a slave. And now he's fixing to, he's in prison. He didn't complain. The whole time he was obedient. Look at where all he's been. He's placed into a pit. He was sold into slavery. He's been hit on by a married lady. He was falsely accused and imprisoned. Check this out. So while he's in prison, I didn't put the verses up here. I'm just going to tell y'all the story. Check this out. He's in prison, right? And he's right at the palace in prison. He's put in charge of everything, okay, in prison. Well, while he's in prison, there's these two guys that have a fallen out with Pharaoh. One of them is a cupbearer. The cupbearer is the dude that drinks a drink to make sure that there ain't no poison in the drink, right? And the other one was the Pharaoh's baker. Both of these cats have a dream. Y'all tracking with me? This is Joseph, Mr. Dream Man, right? So all of a sudden, they said, can anybody interpret the dreams? And Joseph says, hey, I got you. I don't have you. God's actually got you. But God can interpret it through me. So the cupbearer goes first, and he tells him his dream. He says, look, man, in three days, Pharaoh's going to come to you, and he's going to put you back, in, back into the palace, and you're going to be sipping his wine and checking it out for Pharaoh. You're going to be restored to your position. How cool is that? So you know that Baker was sitting over there, well, I had a dream too. Man, I want mine to be like his. And so he says, can I tell you my dream? So he tells him his dream, and guess what happened? Joseph says, here's, your, here's the answer to your dream. In three days, Pharaoh's going to cut your head off. And he's going to stick it on a pole and stick you outside of town. Now, what do you think the rest of the prisoners in there said? I ain't nobody having no more dreams. But we cut them dreams off. I was like, you got a dream? Nope, don't have a dream. No, I ain't got none. Are we good? I don't have none to say. That's good. I'm good with that. But that's not what happened. So Joseph tells the cupbearer, says, hey, man, when you get back before Pharaoh, would you remember me? And he says, sure, dude. Peace out. He forgot him, dude. So for two more years, uh, Joseph's in jail for two more years you're talking about being ticked off i would be pretty upset with god at this point anybody else feel that way he never was he was obedient to the plan he's sticking with the plan you go man i got four years of this and actually i'm probably gonna have six because i've changed my degree four times right <laughs> And you go, but why? I don't know why. Maybe because if you're here two more years, maybe you can share the gospel with more people. Now, that's an interesting twist on it. I don't know. I don't know why God's got you here. But I can tell you this. His plan is perfect. Look at this. So now, Joseph is now restored. So the cupbearer... Let me back up. Let me back up. All right. So... The cupbearer gets out, right? And then all of a sudden, Pharaoh has a dream, all right? And matter of fact, he has a dream, and nobody can interpret it. And all of a sudden, this cupbearer goes, oh, yeah, dude, I'm so sorry. I was supposed to tell you about somebody. Two years later, man, I would be, mm -mm. Um, I would have some roots of bitterness springing up everywhere, but not Joseph. All of a sudden, the cupbearer says, man, go get that Hebrew guy over in, uh, back in prison. So they go get Joseph, clean him up, bring him to Pharaoh, 
And Pharaoh tells him his dream and says, look, man, seven years now, you're going to have more food than you know what to do with. The crops are going to be bumper crops. It's going to be awesome. And then, but seven more years after that, you're going to see a famine like you've never seen. And man, people are going to be dying. People are going to be searching for food. You need to put somebody in charge of that. And Pharaoh's like, man, none of my other guys could tell me about this dream. Nobody but you. You seem to be the smartest cat in the room. So guess what? He takes, he takes Joseph and places him in charge of everything inside of Egypt. My man went from the pit to Potiphar's house to prison to now he's Pharaoh's number two guy. Wow. And you say, how'd he get here? He got here not through the way he thought he would get there. How are you going to get to where God's got you? Not the way you think you're going to get there. And some of you planners and engineers out there who say, man, I got this plan. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be married in 2.5 years, and I'm going to have 1.2 kids. And it's going to be, one's going to be male and one's going to be female. And, it's going to be, and we're going to be married for 105 years. And You're not. Maybe you will if God's, God's grace allows that. But man, the reality is, you may not. I don't know how much longer you have. I don't know what God's plan is for you. I don't know. But I know he's got you here right now, and one moment of obedience could change your entire generation, starting with you. So check this out. So finally, his brothers do show up. 20 years later, they hadn't seen this cat in 20 years, so don't none of them know who he is. So Joseph said to his brothers, Genesis 45, I'm Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him. Yeah, because they're about to TT on themselves because they're so scared. Because they're like, uh. Well, the reason they went to go see Joseph is because all of their crops died too. So they had to go to Egypt in order to find food. So Joseph said to his brothers, man, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother, the one you sold into Egypt. And now, don't be distressed and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been famine in the land, and for the next five, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all of Egypt. I don't care why, where you're at right now. I want you to give God the glory. You say, Lane, you don't know what all has happened to me, and you don't know what all has happened to my family. You're right, I don't. But I, I know a God who has a plan, and I know that he loves you, and he's, he's saved me and brought me here to tell you tonight that he loves you. He loves you way more than Daddy Bodhouse could ever love you, and I love you for being here, and I love you. But God has a plan for you, and it's great. You always give God the glory, and man, there's weight in that, and I know it. You are going to go through some junk, and some of you guys have been through junk this past week. Life is going to be heavy. You're either in the storm right now, you're fixing to go into it, or you're coming out of it. It's one of those three scenarios. I've lived 52 years, and I can promise you I know this to be fact. And you've got to decide right now, am I going to give God the glory ahead of time? 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, you do it all for the glory of God. That means when you're working, when you're playing, when you're in your relationship with your girlfriend, boyfriend, when you're at boathouse, when you're at the gym, when you're wherever your feet are, that's what you're going to do is give God the glory. Somebody asked me one time, Lane, why do you write go God on all your texts? You'll see it if you see me online. I'll put it, go God. That's my way of saying, go God. You do whatever you want to do. Because when I got saved, when I was a senior in college, I wrote in my Bible. And that's why every one of you cats has prayed to receive Christ with me here at Boathouse. I say, pull out your word. If you don't have a word, I'm going to get you one. 
And we're going to write in there the time and date that you accepted Christ because that now becomes your pivot point to know what you're going to do from here on out. How you're going to act, what you're going to do, the friends you're going to hang out with. I can look at your top three friends and tell you what type of person you are. It will change your friend group. When you start serving Jesus, it changes everything. And you're going to be sick until you do change. So I write that everywhere. Go God. You say, well, what do, what do you know about being through some heavy stuff? Man, when I married Mama, we were told him instantly we couldn't have kids. Instantly. And Mama said, we're going to have three. And some of you guys have heard my story. I'm not going to belabor the whole story. I'll tell you this real quick. We did a, a procedure called IVF. We had two embryos. The two embryos y'all see walking around here is Josiah and Johanna. Mama told me, she said, we're going to have three kids. And I went, the doctor says, we, we're not going to have any. We have two. Let's call it good. It's a boy and a girl. We're 50-50 on some of that. Josiah and Johanna, they're kind of crazy. Anyway, 10 months, 10 months later, all of a sudden, I come in from deer hunting, which I don't know why Mama let me off to go deer hunting. Thank you, Mom. But when I came in, Mama handed me a pacifier and says, we're pregnant with number three. 18 months later, Josh was born. So when I tell you I serve a God that knows the beginning from the end, I, I serve a God that can do miracles. I've seen it. And that's, that's why I'm here tonight to tell you all that. All right, here we go. Uh, so how did this cat wind up in, uh, in the hall of faith? So now he's gone he's saved his entire generation. And they told him, and he told his dad and his brothers and all of their family, you guys move to Egypt. Pharaoh gave them the choicest land. They began to multiply and grow, and they became millions of people in the land of Egypt. And 179 years later, he says, at 110 when he's fixing to die, he said, when you guys leave this land, Y'all take my bones with you to where the promised land that God is going to give the children of Israel. He didn't have a clue about where his bones were going to go and how he was going to wind up there. But by God's faith, the faith he had in God, they took his bones. Moses took his bones up out of that country in Egypt and planted them in the promised land. You say, Lane, why did you tell us all that tonight? Well, here's why I told y'all all of that tonight. Did you know that the story of Joseph is not really the story of Joseph? The story of Joseph is a foreshadowing of the story of Jesus. I told y'all this story tonight about how Joseph went from the pit to Potiphar's house to prison to the palace to tell y'all this one thing. Here's Joseph, look up on the screen. Here's Jesus. So let's look and see how the stories align. Joseph was who? He was the favorite son of Jacob. Who was Jesus? He was God's only son, his beloved son. Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. Jesus was betrayed by his followers, by me and you. Our sin hung him on the cross. Joseph was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. Jesus was falsely accused by the Pharisees. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Joseph was sent to Egypt in order to save his people. Jesus was sent to earth to save you, to save me, to save us. Joseph forgave his brothers. They betrayed him. He didn't have to, and he was reconciled to them. Jesus offers this forgiveness tonight, young people, for you so that you could be reconciled to a holy God. The one thing about Boathouse that I'm gonna always say, man, obedience is, it's not easy. 
but it requires one thing of you. You've got to repent, man, and turn from your wicked ways. You gotta turn from your sin. Some of you cast tonight, y'all love your sin, man. Sin's fun. Dude, I know, I get it. I've been there. I understand, sin is fun. If it wasn't fun, you wouldn't wanna do it. It's kinda like a fishing lure. I'm not gonna use something I ain't gonna catch fish with. Same thing with sin, though. It's got a hook in it. And this is what Satan doesn't tell you. Yeah, it's fun until it's not. The thing about sin is, guys, it's gonna take you way further than you ever wanted to go. It's gonna cost you way more than you ever wanted to pay. And it's gonna keep you longer than you ever wanted to stay. And it has death attached to it. What I'm talking about, guys, is a million years from now, is that you and I can laugh and cut up and carry on and have fun. Because a million years from now, you're not gonna care. You probably won't remember this talk. But I can tell you a million years from now, if you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're gonna remember this talk. And you're gonna remember how I sat there in my pride and said, you know what, this is, I'm gonna hold on to my little nights of going out to Cowboys. I'm gonna hold on to my little nights of hanging out and doing things I shouldn't be doing. I'm gonna hang on to my, my little sin addiction that I've got on my little phone. God didn't come down here and give his life, man. He gave it because he loved you. That's why we have Boathouse, dude. And that's why I'm here tonight, is to tell you that God loved you, and he loves you. I don't know how much longer you got, and I ain't saying that to scare you. I'm saying that because that's the truth. I don't know how much longer I've got, and if God takes me tonight, I'm gonna be super stoked, because man, I got to tell y'all this message. Peace out. I'll catch y'all on the flip side. Mama says, shut up, you can't say that. <laughs> That's okay, Mama, I'm just joking. <laughs> I don't want to leave you either. So I'm telling you, man, God's got a plan for you, and it's perfect and great. It ain't going to be the way you thought, and that's okay. But uh, I think it's all God wanted to say tonight, guys. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for these young people. And God, I know there's somebody under the sound of my voice right now. <laughs> That's not a, that doesn't believe in you. It's not sure. They're not sure whether they're saved or not. And God, I pray tonight for that person. I pray that tonight that they would go on the deck, drive a stake in the ground and say, you know what, God? I've been playing church. I've been playing religion. I'm ready to give up religion and I want a relationship. I want, I want, to, I want to know you, God. God, that's why Romans 10, 9 says, we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus was raised from the dead. You will be saved. Romans 3, 23 says, we've all sinned and we've all fallen short. 6, 23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Guys, he loves you. And God, I pray tonight for that young person that tonight would be the night that they would drive a stake in the ground, that that would be the turning point for their future family. God, that would be the turning point that they would drive a stake in the ground wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, God, I want to follow you. And God, I pray tonight for that person. But there's also other people in the room, God, that I know are followers of yours, that they have a dream, but they're scared to step out and, and take the next step, whatever that is. Maybe it's going down in that lake and getting dumped and being baptized just like you were. And God, I pray for for boldness for them that they would have the courage to go out here to sign up to follow you in, in baptism. But there's a third group here too, God. I know that you've placed on their heart maybe to become full-time ministry. And you say, well, Lane, what does that mean? God, full-time ministry means in the workplace as a pastor, as a, as a pharmaceutical rep, as a uh, surgeon, as a nurse, as a whatever God, would they just share Jesus wherever they are and give them the boldness to do that? But whatever that burden, whatever that thing is that you've placed in their heart, that tonight would be the, they would plant that seed in the ground and God, that they would bloom exactly where you've planted them right here in Tyler, Texas. And God, I pray for Smith County. I pray that you would use Boathouse to change East Texas and to change Texas and to change the United States and to change the world. And God, let it start with us. Let it start with me and let it start tonight with one person, more than one, getting it right by accepting you as their Lord and Savior. 
And tonight, I pray that your spirit would fall on this place, God, and people would leave here changed. God, thank you for the chance to come here tonight to share this message. And we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.